we've been following a completely wiped out concept. We think we've been applying lean. We've been dressing up what we've been doing for such a long time, for decades, under the heading of lean. What we actually mean is leaning down. Lean follows a principle of let's, for instance, drop the stock down, see what happens, tackle the issues, and let the stock drop down again, tackle the issues, let it continue to drop down. And while we're doing that, we're also working on our production capabilities to be able to produce a batch of one. If we look at the modern day retail supply chain, whether or not it is domestic or international, we've been just chopping costs out. We've been taking inventory out. We've been doing it by KPIs. We've been incentivized to look at the stock turn and go, it needs to be lower, right? Let's reduce our stock. Don't worry about the problems. Don't worry about the fallout from this. Let's just do it. Welcome and thank you for joining me today. My name is Gary Newbury. I'm a senior executive on call, helping businesses in the make, move, sell flow of consumer goods and services. My purpose is to inspire business leaders, particularly those within the consumer products and retailing space, to think big, be bold, scale, adapt and win one epic supply chain transformation at a time. There's additional content available through my website, retailaid.ca, or on my YouTube channel, Retail Aid. Be sure to check it out. As a business world faces much volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, organizations need to be tapping into resources with an inside edge on transitioning their teams to be agile, innovative, and digital with thought leaders, experts, and senior executives who have mastery of operational turnarounds and strategic transformations to help reorientate their enterprises. There's great material to get through here, so let's get started. Hello, listeners. If you are a regular, welcome back. If you are new, this weekly show catches you up on the latest news and trends in retail. I'm your host, Julia Raymond Hare. Today, you'll be hearing from our wonderful guest host, Paula Rosenblum, the managing partner and co founder at Retail Systems Research. She's our advisor and widely recognized as a top retail influencer. Quick announcement for you before we dive in. On June 8th, we're launching a brand new 13-page report covering the latest thinking in retail store management. You'll see exclusive insights provided to Rethink Retail by over 10 thought leaders, including retail executives. And you'll learn what a three-month study of 3,000 stores revealed about managing stores, which three retailers are leading the Agile stores movement, and how top retailers are enjoying a sales lift upwards of 200,000 per year for each store manager using this specific approach. Follow our social channels and visit our website at rethink.industries and you'll find your copy, Retailers Reflect on the Future of Stores, Store Management for 2021 and Beyond. Hi, everybody. I'm Paula Rosenblum, your Retail Rundown host for the week. Joining me today are Gary Newberry and Lisa Amlani. Gary is a senior exec on call specializing in retail supply chains and last mile. He currently operates via Retail AID, a consulting practice helping businesses to become agile, that's the A, innovative, that's the I, and digital, which is the D, through operational turnaround and strategic transformation. He created this practice early in the pandemic to help disrupted retail ecosystem create new successes and get it back in order. Lisa is the principal at the Retail Strategy Group, a consulting practice that helps companies in the retail space dramatically improve their profitability. She's a respected voice on topics such as responsible retail and sustainability, the future of retail and the urgency of technology enablement in merchandise, assortment, optimization, and demand planning. Lisa, Gary, thanks so much for joining the show today. Pleasure. Very honored to be here to talk about retail supply chains. It's been a little bit of a bugbear for many companies involved in retailing or in supporting retailers. And it's worth us having an opportunity to share some thoughts. Agreed. And it's complicated by the fact that different products are sourced different ways, which I think we'll get into in a while. If there's one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed more than anything, is just how brittle our supply chain is. And it's brittle everywhere. It's brittle close to the point of demand, 
and it's brittle, producing items far from the point of demand. The 2020 global shutdown shocked the supply chain as temporary trade restrictions and shortages of pharmaceutical, medical supplies, and other products demonstrated the world high dependence on China. I also have to add sporting goods, toilet paper, and other items. <laughs> Beyond that, and to that point, part of the supply chain that tends to have production close to the point of demand wasn't that agile either. And since then, we've seen shortages impacting nearly every industry out there, and maybe even more importantly, fundamental unpredictability. Some orders come early, some orders come late. From computer trips to diapers, lumbers, and meat, ranging from chicken to hot dogs, North America continues to see product shortages just as pandemic measures are easing up. Imported goods, including coffee, cheese, seafood, olive oil, and chlorine, actually, being from Miami, I have to mention chlorine, are facing months of shipping delays. So here's my first question for you, lovely people. From your perspective, how is it that the business world was so vastly underprepared for a potential break in the supply chain? And the first question, Gary, this is for you. What's caused such unpredictability in the supply chain? I think we've been following a completely wiped out concept, which is we think we've been applying lean. We've been using lean technology, but we haven't. But we've been dressing up what we've been doing for such a long time, for decades, under the heading of lean. What we actually mean is leaning down. And what that means is that lean follows a principle of let's, for instance, drop the stock down, see what happens, let's tackle the issues and let the stock drop down again, tackle the issues, let it continue to drop down. And while we're doing that, we're also working on our production capabilities to be able to produce a batch of one. If we look at the modern day retail supply chain, whether or not it is domestic or international, but let's focus on domestic, we've been just chopping costs out. We've been taking inventory out. We've been doing it by KPIs. We've been incentivized to look at the stock turn and go, it needs to be lower, right? Let's reduce our stock. Don't worry about the problems. Don't worry about the fallout from this. Let's just do it. And we are able to achieve a lower cost of operating through divesting ourselves of inventory, which we might need, reducing our headcount, which we might need, reducing our size of facilities, which we might need, and reducing our overall number of facilities, which we might need. Why might we need it? We might need it for a rainy day, like a pandemic, geopolitical situation, a, a change in market dynamic, or anything, any risk. We have become completely underprepared, under-resourced, under-talented in some ways for dealing with things out of the normal. We've been used to a world of maybe two to three percent growth, which is normally represented by population growth more than anything. So as long as the population keeps within a, a bound, we can just incentivize ourselves or find ways of being more productive. But fundamentally, we've been on a path of absolute destruction and it's taken a pandemic to reveal how brittle and how fragile we are and how underprepared we are to tackle major disruption. From a merchant perspective, I think just thinking about the way we plan product assortments, the way that we plan so far ahead in time and in-season planning is pretty much non-existent unless you're an off-price retailer like a TJX. So all of that combined with shifting the way we're working with our retail staff, going from customer service and product experts to fulfillment and logistics that they're not even trained for. We were inherently unprepared for any sort of shift in the way we work. The wonderful thing about the pandemic, and sadly there is a wonderful thing, which is it really sifted through retailers that did not allow for change in the way that they were working. So identifying things like how to enable digitization across your line plan, how to cut out some of those approvals that actually nobody needs. And of course, digitizing the way that product was created closer to market. That's really what came out of the pandemic. It got rid of the players that didn't want to play the game in the future, but also it identified many points of traditional ways of working that just were not working anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to look at it slightly differently. Um, it's close to what you both are saying, but it's a little different. 
And that is that we've sacrificed agility for the sake of efficiency. It's really efficient to order big slugs of product from China if you're buying clothes or Vietnam or wherever. And it's not efficient to store big piles of rolls of toilet paper because it's bulky, there's not a lot of margin in it, and it's taking up expensive shelf space. And so the way I tend to look at it is on the North American supply chain, what I believe we found was fear of the bullwhip effect, which is that, oh my God, if we don't do something, we'll end up with piles of product in the supply chain. I just think the apparel industry doesn't know what the heck to do anymore. It's so used to these big slugs. I mean, you need a really good PLM system to be able to deal with alternate sources and That seems like it's been a problem. One other subject that I think I really wanted to talk about is that in other industries, sales and operations planning is run by people in the supply chain, you know, because the items are typically replenishable. It's certainly not like fashion where it's one and done or it's when it's hot, it's hot, and then you're watching it fall off the end of the table. It's run by a different group. I've been an analyst for 20 years, and it's really hard to get the supply chain vendors who may happen to sell planning systems to understand that in retail, particularly in apparel retailing, the supply chain is the tail and the merchants are the dog. And the dog wags the tail, the tail doesn't wag the dog. And sometimes they're lucky if they know when a shipment is showing up, what time if if somebody calls for an appointment before 15 minutes. So is this wrong? Lisa, what do you think? Oh my God, I'd love to talk about this because this just reminds me of my days that when we had set up Ralph Lauren Canada and how the U.S. system did not talk to the Canadian system. And then there was bottlenecks at NLS, which was our 3PL at the time. And I didn't know about it because I got the call that, oh, by the way, all these goods are here. I didn't even know they were coming. They were early. They were in the beginning of that three-month ship window. So it all comes down to cross-functional teams that work in silos and retail, they love to work in silos. We all know this, we've all been there and that is something that needs to change. So now, as we look at how you said merchants are the dogs, the dogs wagging the tail and supply chain is at the end. But if you shift that way of thinking, which is what a lot of retailers are doing, is they're actually adding the customer into that model and the customers in the middle And then everything should be driven from what the customer wants and when they want it and, of course, what they want. So when you think about it that way, you don't think about supply chain being at the end and merchants and planners being at the beginning. You think about all of these people all working together to serve that single customer. I think once you shift that way of thinking, you can start to change behaviors and the way retailers are actually modeled in their functional teams. Once you change that and you change the mindset, you can start to shift the way how cross-functional teams work together and how they should be working together. As a buyer, even when I was in England, I was working for EMEA, Ralph Lauren EMEA. I had to say yes to air C decisions if product wasn't gonna make that ship window. But I wasn't getting contacted from my supply chain people because I didn't even know who they were. I was not in contact with them because I had to go through four other people to understand, okay, do I need to approve this air sea shipment? Is it going to come, you know, off of my bottom line? Is it going to come off supply chain? So there's just too many layers. We just need to stop and simplify. Well, it's actually gotten worse because of the ascendance of marketing in the, in the last decade and a half or so. So now it's not just supply chain and the merchants aren't talking to each other, but marketing will run a promotion and not even tell merchandising they're doing it. And somehow you've got to find the product to work for that. You know? Oh, I have lived that life. <laughs> I have lived it. And it's awful. It's awful to chase product when marketing is also hoarding insights from data that merchants are not even getting. So again, it's those silos working together. And thank you for bringing up marketing because I didn't even think to go there because I was just like, what about those air sea decisions? But yes, promotional uh, material, so important to talk to marketing and them understand, okay, what are we buying in the first place before putting things on promotion or in marketing material? Gary, what are your thoughts on this matter? When we think about retailing and retailing has been around for centuries, but more more recently in the last hundred years, it has always been merchandising in stores has been the most important, the black princes of merchandising and stores. This is where the adult work goes on. 
And the supply chain has been, well, it wasn't even called a supply chain until about like 10, 15, 20 years ago. It was like distribution. And that really put everything in its context. You, you just get on a truck and send it to the store, get on with it. So to imagine in that world of somebody from distribution who runs the trucks coming along and saying, hey, I'm going to help coordinate the business and bring it all together, understand the constraints, understand the bottlenecks and collaboratively work through this to get to a much better position of service, of margin, of our brand. It's very hard to actually understand within how we've been doing things. But much to what Lisa said, uh, you know, if there's any good things that might come out of this pandemic, and there's been a lot of unfortunate things that have happened along the way, the lockdowns and restrictions have been very much a pause. And what I'm looking for is a reset of our organizational structures, our cultures, what we choose to measure. People have been talking about just-in-time systems. And it sounds very neat and tidy. We, we just deliver stuff just in time. And I think anybody sitting around in this forum will say, that's absolutely not the case. We have not been producing just in time containers of stock into our distribution center to respond to our customers. Right. What it is, is a blooming great forecast. We place a dirty great order. We get a number of containers on various ships, get them into our DCs, rack them, pick them and send them out to our stores and say, there you are, sell it. It's very hard to imagine that a supply chain person, even a chief supply chain officer, will try and put a halt on that and just say, this is a push strategy. It's very hard to organise an SNOP situation when we're actually running a push situation rather than a pull situation, which lean and, and agility to an extent relies on. So it's not a surprise that the SNOP systems are more fragmented than, say, in a manufacturing concern, and how they may have found a way into the world of merchandising, because on many situations, and each retailer is very unique in this, there isn't a clear model that applies generally within a category, certainly not across the whole of the retail industry, of how we do things around here. So we can actually just develop a tool to actually unravel that and, and make the supply chain much more clear. Uh, much more transparent. It's a horizontal process. It runs from here, which might be the farm, through the manufacturing, maybe through a wholesaler, but certainly through a retailer, out to stores, out to people's porches as such, and to horizontalize that. And so the job of a merchandiser in, in that world is to sort out the assortment plan, work out the demand, whether or not that's pull or push, and leave it to the supply chain to get on with it. And until we achieve that, supply chain will never run the SNOP procedure within retail? I guess there's a couple things that I wanted to mention. One is that people do what they're paid to do. And the operations guys, the guys who run the logistics and the supply chain, they're paid based on what their percentage of sales is, period, full stop, right? Merchants are paid on term. There's a tweak in the mathematics associated with term that really encourages them to bring in big slugs of product at the beginning of the month because they have then the longest amount of time to sell it. So there's some definite issues there. Beyond that, I just think we've been studying, doing this research for years. Some of it is a technology issue, and some of it is just they're not even physically in the same building in, in the case of large retailers, you know. How can we get to where we are now, which is a world of efficiency, and have our cake of efficiency and eat it too, which means agility? What kind of actions do you think that companies need to take to make their supply chains more agile, apart from the obvious of everybody talking to each other. I would tell you in this case, nobody had a clue how long this was going to go on. So we could have talked forever. If you would have told me I would have been locked down for 14 months, I would have, come on, you know? <laughs> and so Lisa, what, do, what actions do you think companies should take to make their supply chains more agile? I think what they need to start to do is look at their assortment planning and how they plan different seasons and change the way they do that. Because I think if we started to infuse a more seasonless product, we wouldn't be dependent on drops, like at a minimum four drops a year to four drops a month in some cases, you know, with the fast fashion retailers of the world. But I think if we look at the way we plan our assortments and remove that season category, that way we can actually overbuy less produce less, have less markdowns. And I think that 
when we look at assortment planning and what a merchant's role is and how data and analytics and predictive analytics and AI and machine learning, how all of that could help us predict what the customer actually wants and when they want it and in which channel they want it. I think that will help not only reduce the strains on the supply chain, but also the dependencies of certain categories like what we saw with toilet paper or how everyone of course stopped buying formal wear because people were stuck in their homes. So I think that there's definitely a lot of work to be done in that space. I'll give you another example. In Canada, a lot of us are still under lockdown and stores are slowly beginning to open. When they do open, I know from a lot of my merchant friends that they are going to do fall flips as soon as the stores open. So they're sitting on all this spring summer inventory that didn't get a chance to be sold because they didn't set up curbside. They couldn't. Even if they did, they didn't sell enough. Right. But they're going to be sitting on all this excess inventory and they're going to mark it down right away. I guess one thing I wonder, and there's some things that people have been talking about for 20 years. And one of them is reducing, you talk about four flips to the stores. Well, it really should be that way, even if it's the same product. The problem is it's all brought in in these huge slugs, which means you've placed big bets. So that leads you to the same notion of maybe finding alternative sources. And to do that, do you think PLM type systems where you can have a pretty fixed bill of material and, and, and a design of how you want it made can help improve the situation? Yeah. Absolutely. And that ties right into digital product creation and automation of parts of your tech pack. You don't need to recreate the wheel. Exactly. Uh, there's a lot of work being done around materials management and to manage those materials better so that you're not developing new stuff every single season. Every... That's a big problem, huge problem. Let's talk about how the shipments from parts of China, like they're not getting through. That's what's stuck in LA in the ports. And India, I mean, awful what's happening there and how that's impacting the garment industry because nobody's working. So yes. what's happening with number one, all that product that's sitting there, but all the orders that were placed beforehand. Oh, and then of course, all the orders that were canceled when the COVID started, it's a challenge. And I think it does start with thinking about how you plan your assortment. And where you're going to get it as well. And when you're going to bring it yes. in staging of receipts. It is about optimizing that that vendor base and supply chain and suppliers and where your raw materials are coming from. And you should have contingency plans in place that are localized because if you don't, then you have goods stuck in the Suez Canal and you're not getting those bike parts. <laughs> we know a lot of a lot of companies are stuck because their bike chains are on a boat. <laughs> it's funny because I do some work with a group called the American Apparel Producers Network. And they're all focused around Central America and South America. They can really turn stuff around fast and they have grown. There are a goodly number of companies that are working with them now as alternative sources, but I think not nearly enough. And that's one way to hedge your bets, which is to say, instead of having to wait four weeks, can we get it done in two weeks because we cut out the ocean trip? Exactly. Um, exactly. There are two basic concepts in agility. One is to develop capabilities and the other one is to develop capacity so i'm just going to focus on the latter because it's probably easier for people to visualize capacity expansions and here we're talking about capabilities is horizontally how do we develop things which we can adapt as customers progress their own individual journeys we can adapt these capabilities to do that but that that's a more cerebral discussion but capacity is much more straightforward and i've had this conversation many, many times and I bump into the same objections and, and almost defensiveness. What we need to move is to a world where instead of us single sourcing to get the bulk discounts, get over the minimum orders, we need to get to a world where we're price indifferent and also that we collaborate in a very different way. I, I'm not saying we have a chance, we actually technically collaborate with multiple suppliers, maybe in different regimes, in different countries, in different tax regimes, different political regimes. So we have capacity and we have to hook in our systems to have very clear visibility of capacity. So when we're having our, our thoughts about our demand plan, 
we can actually sit these supplies in the same room. Now that's a bit of a hurdle for most people to even get their mind around, but we have multiple suppliers all sitting in the same room, obviously virtually, and we're saying we've got 2,000 things that we need to be made, and we can look into each other's systems and find out what is the best way through this for this month. We need to have those flexible options and we need to test them frequently because part of agility is to be able to move from one state to another effortlessly, but also to learn how to do that under pressure and to learn from that and to adapt. So if we have a primary supply chain design, which is, you know, we get the stuff to the port, let's say we're in China or Vietnam or somewhere in the Far East, we've traditionally find a container, fill it up, get it on the road, get it to the port, get it on the ship, get it to a West Coast port, get it onto a road or railhead, get it to somewhere in the vicinity of the DC and then transport it by road to the DC and then the normal thing takes over. We need to try different things all the time. So we need to have, be pricing different with our suppliers. So we have the price set very close to the price set. So we're indifferent about which supplier. So we're looking at the capacities of a supplier in the short range so we can actually place it with the best supplier at that time to give us the best service. So we don't need so much inventory. We don't need to take bets. We can actually get that inventory to us a lot quicker without the liability of bringing a whole numbers of containers across. So when we think about agility, we need to really test our traditional assumptions upon which we have been buying in the past and how we interact with our suppliers. We've typically had a prime supplier, good discount rates. And so when we go to another supplier, normally in a bit of a rush, we end up paying over the odds. We often might say, oh, fly it. We don't know how they, how connected they are with air traffic flows. We don't know anything. So what we've seen in a pandemic is a complete and utter breakdown of everything because we've never tried it before. We've always thought that this is going to work. This is going to work. We've got our supply chain design. It's working. Oops, the pandemic. Borders are shut. Things are disrupted. What do we do? We shout loud. I mean, it certainly was a singularity, but it also was an accelerant. And, and I think it exposed things that were out there already. I mean, as we talked about before, we've been whining about these large slugs of product coming in all at once, particularly on the apparel side forever. There are companies and people at very high levels who've talked about the bullwhip effect enough so that those selling commodities are afraid to make too much because they're afraid they're going to have it stacked up over the supply chain. Do you think, Lisa, that when you think about this cadence of when product is coming in, is that part of assortment planning or do you see that as part of just open to buy management? It's definitely part of assortment planning. What we do generally, like if you work with a bigger organization like a Ralph Lauren or Clubonico, such as I have, you work with your sourcing partners, but at the end of the day, you are driving your assortment as a merchant. You work closely with planning and sourcing, but you are determining when you want the goods how it's going to fit on the shop floor. You work with your visual directors to understand what does that look like? But yeah, I, I would say absolutely from a merchant assortment perspective, but I do think that you need to involve these other players because if there's no capacity in the DC, when you're expecting those goods and you, you know, it's an important flip and it's for fall and it's, you know, going to be featured in a few magazines, then of course you need to tell your supply chain, your DC counterparts, but that's not really happening as much as it should. I'm not saying it doesn't happen at all, but I think that it's not happening as much as it should because you do have to plan with your partners so that they can make space for the goods. I mean, I think for fashion product, for sure, we, you know, it, we've been studying for years and the problem of lack of cohesive planning with cross-functional teams has always been an issue. I think for the shorter supply chain, what we'll call domestic, depending on the country you live in or close to domestic suppliers, I actually think it's a collaboration issue. If I go back to the great toilet paper shortage, which was blamed on everything from hoarding to, you know, people are not going to work anymore. What I attributed it to was that the manufacturers didn't want to get stuck with piles of toilet paper. And if they had worked with the retailer, they could have put some satellite distribution points 
you know, containers or trucks are just really inexpensive and then get them to the places where they were needed. And instead of shipping 36 packs, which was the first thing that became available, start with fours and eights and, and limit one or two per customer. So I feel like collaboration is really a key in those products that are replenishable. When we talk about collaboration, Paula, there's a certain amount of inconvenience around collaboration as we currently execute it. We kind of say, oh, we want you as a partner. You know, here's our demand. Uh, we're sharing that with you and we're sharing the POS information with you. There's collaboration in it. Oh, can I have a discount? And I want to change the spec. But it's not real collaboration. Collaboration is opening your books, saying this is the profit we're going to make on this. We want to share this profit between us equitably so we both win. If we're working together and you're able to deliver the demand that we want you to deliver and we pass it out to the stores and it's successful, we both win. And, and until we move to that situation of open books, we can talk about collaboration all we like, but reality is we're still in kind of conflict. Yeah, I think, conflict. you know, we do a lot of research on the subject and we've found that consistently this is a problem. And we tend to separate retail winners, which are those who overperform on comparable sales from everybody else. And we find that winners are definitely better at collaborating with their vendors. But I don't think the grocery industry had any idea what was coming to it, you know, or the sporting goods industry for that matter. Here in Canada, we did actually have a glimmer of collaboration in that first few weeks because we have our major big food companies like Kraft and Nestle and Conagra, and they couldn't meet the, the requirements from Costco, Walmart, Lowe's, right. Sobeys, etc. So guess what? They actually ha all had to sit down together and say, what SKUs can we get rid of? Because they're like two specialists and they use too much capacity in the production. And how do I get 2,000 units into each store of whatever it is? So we have to actually work together. So I think we're out of time now, unfortunately, and we could definitely do this for hours because it's a really interesting topic. I think in summary, we're saying definitely there needs to be more collaboration. Definitely smaller slugs of product alternative sources are a good idea. And honestly, pray that we never have to live through something like this again, really, push comes to shove. So I wanted to thank both Lisa and Gary for this pretty stimulating discussion that could have gone on all day, I think. And uh, thanks to Julia for making it possible. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, Julia. You've been listening to the Rethink Retail podcast. If you would like to be considered as a guest on our show, apply at rethink.industries slash podcast guest. For sponsorship opportunities, send us an email at media at rethink.industries. You can help support our team at Rethink Retail by dropping us a rating and review on your iTunes podcast app. To each and every one of you, thanks so much for tuning in. Retail never sleeps. See you next week. Thank you for listening today. I hope the information has been valuable for you and your team. You can connect with me via the website retail.ca and go to the contact page or via LinkedIn by typing linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash last dash mile. Look forward to hearing from you and playing an active part with your supply chain and your business's transformation as you start to act boldly Think big, scale, adapt, and win.